namo bhagavate vasudevaya om namo bhagavate vasudevaya श्री कश्यप उवाच एथन में भगवान पृष्ठ प्रजा खामस्य पद्म यदा ते व्रतम केशवतोषनम Shri Kashyapa Muni said When I desired offspring I placed inquiries before Lord Brahma who is born from a lotus flower Now I shall explain to you the same process Lord Brahma instructed me by which Keshava the Supreme Personality of Godhead is satisfied. We are reading today from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 8, Chapter 16, entitled The Payovrata Process of Worship, Text 24. The scene of this event takes place in the higher planets where there is facilities for heavenly enjoyment, unimaginable to the people of this earthly planet. But yet we find, even in this high abode, there is suffering. Abramabhuvanaloka punar apratunorjana mamupetya tukonte apunar janmana vidyate. From the highest planet in this material world, even Brahmaloka, down to the lowest planet, Patalaloka and everything in between. They are, a, they are all places where the essential basis is suffering. The one who attains my abode never has to take birth again in this material existence. Yes, there are forms of enjoyment in this earthly planet, people are mad after enjoyment, especially in cities like Mumbai, where whatever technological, scientific advancement human society makes, they try to create more and more facilities for enjoyment. But because puna puna charavata charavananam, whatever enjoyment it is and whatever form it may take, it is all, according to Prahlad Maharaj, like chewing the chewed. Because in every species of life, we are enjoying different types of sensory pleasures, primarily through eating, sleeping, mating, defending nothing new about it, but because it doesn't satisfy the heart and we don't know where else to look, we have to try to create newer ways of doing the same old chewing the chewed. Acharyas explained this chewing the chewed process like somebody 
chews on the um, sugar cane and throws the pulp out. The juice is gone. But, somebody, but then we pick it up again to try to get some more juice and some more juice. And what is this? All these different ways are just different styles of chewing. The same pulp. You see here in Mumbai with all the Bollywood and the clubs and the cricket teams and you know, the, it's not enough just to have an uh, international cricket team. Now you have to have competition, national cricket teams and local cricket teams. And it's not enough just to have a nice restaurant. Now you need you know, all sorts of decorations and better menus, and better films and better cars better clothes. It's the same pulp. Different, just different methods of chewing it. That's all. Sorry to <laughs> break this news to you, but there's nothing new. Different methods of chewing it. Sometimes we put different colors on it. But it's the same. And because we're so desperate for pleasure, we become so attached to whatever gives us a sense of pleasure. So yes, there is. Rivo Namamritaji. Very nice to see you. So there is pleasure in this world. But the problem is, it is all built upon the foundation of suffering. And therefore, whatever pleasures there are, are infused with this type of suffering. Dukalayam ashashvatam. Krishna is the creator. He knows how everything works. He knows why everything works. And he, he explains, because everything is temporary, the seed of suffering is within all pleasures of this world. The seed. And the more you enjoy something, the more that seed takes root in your heart. And the deeper the roots go, it's the root of, it's the seed of suffering. It's the root of suffering. The deeper the roots, the more you suffer. If there was no enjoyment in this world, there wouldn't be so much suffering. Because suffering really is the frustration of our attempts to enjoy. But we can't control whoever we may be. Well, the scene of this incident is in the heavenly planets. And Aditi, she is not just an ordinary person. She's the mother of the devas, Indra, Vayu, Agni, Surya, she's the presiding mother of the demigods. What an exalted position she has. But yet she's suffering so much. And why is she suffering? Because she's a mother and she sees that all of her children are suffering. Although the demigods are devotees, Still, most of them are Kamramishra Bhaktis. That means they're serving Krishna by utilizing their talents, but they're very much attached, most of them, to enjoying at the same time. They have material desire.
with the nature of this world, whoever we are, wherever we are. Sufferings come in one form or another. And here we find that the devas lost everything. They lost their prestige. They lost their service to Krishna, at least their external form of service. They lost all their wealth, all their property. They were living like fugitives, disguising themselves, hiding from their enemies, the Asuras, who overpowered them. And seeing this situation, Aditi is so filled with anxiety and nothing could compensate. So Krishapa sees her in this condition and asks her, what's wrong? And he presents the various reasons why people usually become full of anxiety. Did you not receive a guest properly? Did you not follow practice the principles of morality? Art the Kama Dhamma Moksha? So many questions. And Aditi says, actually, I've done everything right. I've made no, no mistakes like this. And the reason I'm in so much anxiety is because our sons are suffering. They have lost everything. And you are such a great prajapati, such a powerful personality. And she's begging with such a sincere heart. She asks, tell me the regulative principles by which I may worship the supreme master of the world so that the Lord will be pleased with me and fulfill all my desires. O best of the Brahmins, kindly instruct me in the perfect method of worshiping the supreme personality of Godhead in devotional servants, by which the Lord will very soon be pleased with me and save me along with my sons from this, this most dangerous condition. She is approaching her husband as her guru. And we find here and in many places, approaching a guru is not a fashion, not a superstition, not just a social custom. We are really receptive to receiving the mercy of the guru when we approach in this sense of sincere desperation. The desperation by which we are not only hungry, we are starving for the shelter of the Lord. It's not a matter of just gaining some, some academic knowledge that we can show to others. It's not just a matter of feeling some security that now I'm connected. Krishna reveals himself through the Guru, through the Vaishnavas. And according to how we approach, according to the sense of need, Krishna reveals himself. According to the sense of urgency, we can receive the gifts of the spiritual master. So Aditi is approaching. It is a material desire that she has, more or less. Within this realm of material existence, her sons are suffering, therefore she's suffering, and she's suffering so bad. Emotional suffering can inflict us with pain often more than any physical suffering has the ability to do. 
Aditi's in perfect health. She has no disease. And where she's from, she never had a disease and she'll never get a disease. Physically, everything's fine for her. But how she's suffering? Because of material, emotional attachment. Because she's identifying with her body and identifying her children as her own. But she is seeking serious shelter. It's urgent. Parikshit Maharaj did not approach Shukadev Goswami as a formality. He had seven days to live. He wanted to attain the perfection of life. He wasn't concerned that he was going to die in seven days. He was concerned that in that seven days he would know Krishna. He was desperate. He wasn't falling asleep during Sukadeva Goswami's Srimad Bhagavat class. His mind was not wandering to you know, what he's going to do next week. So he had nothing to, there wasn't going to be a next week at this life. He wasn't thinking about the past. He was fully engrossed in the present moment hearing from Shukadeva Goswami. That is the consciousness we should have. And similarly, Arjuna, Bhagavad Gita was revealed to the world at a time of the greatest desperation in Arjuna's entire life. Karapanya do so bahatas We see in Mahabharata, Arjuna went through a lot. He lost his kingdom with Yudhisthira Maharaj. He saw the disgrace of his wife, Draupadi, at least the attempt. So many problems. But never did it say that he was weeping and he was pale white and he dropped his Gandiva bow and his mouth was dry and he was fully bewildered. He was really in anxiety, an anxiety he never had in his entire life. And he went through a lot. And it was an emotional anxiety. Just the nature of this world is it puts us in perplexing situations. No matter what we do, no matter how good we are or bad we are, it's not that being pious means you'll be happy. It means being pious, you'll find some happiness in a world that's full of complexities. It was in that state that he begged Krishna. He didn't just inquire. He was begging Krishna, please save me. I need your shelter. I've been your friend all these years. We've had so many friendly talks. No more friendly talks. You're my guru. I'm your disciple. Save me. I can't tolerate this. He was burning in the fire of anguish internally. And that was his state of mind when he was listening to Bhagavad Gita. So the question is, how to become like this. The association of devotees, sadhu sangam, who are striving for this state of consciousness is all important. But also, the reversals that come in life Krishna only allows them to touch his devotees because that's what devotees need, although it's inconceivable. 
It may be our karma, that some reversals, some suffering may come. But as a devotee who's trying to take shelter of the Lord, we're taking shelter of Krishna's internal potency. Krishna can intervene and take away that karma. Why does he let it happen? Or why does he give something extra by his own mercy? Because all the material stuff in this world is coming and going. Krishna just doesn't take it all so seriously. From the perspective of Krishna, all these physical things that are happening in this physical world are just a flash in the reality of eternity. And he sees each and every one of us as eternal souls, such an ananda, full of knowledge and bliss, absolutely beyond this body and all the things connected to this body. I don't say people, I say things. Because the bodies of all the people we love are things. The body is not the person. The soul is the person. And nothing can interrupt our relationships with other souls. Nothing can in disturb our relationship with our own soul or with God, except forgetfulness. And in that forgetfulness, we identify ourselves and others as things, bodies. Even the mind is just a thing, a mundane thing. So Krishna doesn't take all that so seriously. So if, if these things get all mixed up, which they're mixed up anyway, and the soul identifying with it becomes very perturbed. <clears throat> Krishna wants us to be happy. He doesn't want us to suffer. But he doesn't want us to be happy in a way that we're just getting, letting the roots of suffering go deeper and deeper and deeper in our hearts in the name of happiness because ultimately everything is taken away. And that's hard. Krishna wants us to be liberated. Krishna wants us to awaken our love, the ecstasy of the heart. So if we have to go through some temporary problems with these things, in order to help us to actually take shelter of the process of bhakti. Not just do it complacently, or as a formality, or as a rule or a regulation. The rules and regulations are there to keep us steady. So we should follow the rules and regulations. But it's not just following, it's how we follow. It's the spirit. We are told to chant the holy names every day. It's the spirit of how we take shelter. We are told to hear the Srimad Bhagavatam every day. Nasta prayeshi badre shunityam bhagavati sevya. But it's how we take shelter of the Bhagavatam. Aditi was seriously approaching her wife, I mean her husband. <coughs> so many small talks they have about this and that. Of course, there wasn't too much small talk because Kashyapa Muni was usually out meditating. <laughs> and you know, on rare occasions, Aditi would see him when, he was, when his eyes were open. Otherwise, she'd just see him with his eyes closed in some state of trance. So Kashapa Muni, as a great, great soul, he sees his wife's condition, and in today's verse, he's speaking to her. 
And it's, it's a very beautiful instruction we find. Kashyapa Muni simply has no false ego. He's not saying, I will save you, my dear wife. He's telling, because Aditi wants an offspring. She wants someone who's going to reclaim the property of her children. And Kashyap is saying, when I desired offspring, I placed my inquiries before Lord Brahma. And I'm not going to give you something original or new. <clears throat> I'm not going to give you something that I have created by my artistically brilliant genius. I'm not going to tell you something that the world has never seen or heard due to my sublime realizations. I'm going to repeat to you what I heard from Brahma. And there's no ego in this. This is parampara. And our Gurudev, Srila Prabhupada, he stressed this so much because he understood the human nature, that we love to take credit. We love to be the one. We love to be very original that this analogy, I created this. This is my contribution to the, to the universal creation. <laughs> Humility. I'm just a servant of the servant of the servant. I'm just repeating the message. When you're feeling, you're just repeating the message that's always been there, that you have received from your guru. It's a humble state, because in that state you give credit to your guru, and his guru, and his guru. It's not about me. It's about serve serving. <clears throat> Now, if Kashapa Muni wanted to be uh, given credit for great things, what is his power above the people of this world today? <clears throat> An incredible personality. He's the father of the demigods. He's the father of most of the demigods through Aditi and most of the Asuras through Diti. Interestingly, before this point, he has so many children, huge family, a lot of grandchildren. And some of his children, like Indra, they're very, very great, powerful, famous personalities in the side of the devas, the devotees. But his, but his best child, one of his best childs was Prahlad, who happened to be born in the demon side. Yes. From DT came Hiranyakashipu and Hiranyaksha. And the grandson of Kashyapa is Prahlad. So among among the demigods are all devotees, but his, fav but his most glorious son was born of the race of demons. Very interesting. Kashyap is a very incredible personality. Hiranyakashipu, Hiranyaksha were born of a mistake. Yes? DT induced him to come together with her at a very, very inauspicious time. 
but even the greatest benediction came through a mistake. Yes? Prahlad, by material calculation, was a byproduct of a serious mistake. Yes? But by the grace of Narada Muni, he transformed a mistake into a the greatest benediction to the world. Mahajano yena gata sapanta. The way to approach the Supreme Lord is to follow in the footsteps of Mahajans, and one of the greatest of all Mahajans is Prahlad. And another one of the great Mahajans is Bali Maharaj, who's the grandson of Prahlad. So two of the greatest Mahajans and a uh, And two of the greatest examples of the nine processes of devotional service. Prahlad exemplified smaranam, remembering Krishna constantly. Manmanabhavamad bhakto madhyajim namaskuru. Krishna says, always think of me. Prahlad was remembering Krishna 24 hours a day in every situation, whether he was being thrown in fire whether he was being held under a mountain, under the ocean, whether he was being in a pit of snakes that were all venomous. Prahlad had no fear. Now some of us were walking and all of a sudden a snake just pops out from the side of the road and just slithers right in front of us. And you see it has a diamond-shaped head. <laughs> which indicates it's venomous. Yes, and its tongue is slithering. <laughs> and he turns and looks right in your eyes. And you're about six inches away. Will you be afraid? We don't have to admit it to all of us, but just think in your own mind. Yes, you've been a devotee for so many years, perhaps, but will you be afraid? That snake's looking at your eyes and slithering his tongue, and there's no place for you to go, and you're all alone. And if he bites you, there's no Bhaktivedanta medicos there to give you <laughs> anti, anti dose or whatever it's called. You're just, you're, you're just all alone in the middle of a field. Well, Prahlad was thrown in a pit of hundreds and hundreds of snakes where he landed right on top of them. And all their tongues were going tch, tch, tch. But he had no fear. He wasn't the slightest bit fearful. He loved them. He loved the snakes. Maro bira ko bijo icha tohar nitya dasa prati tuva adhikar. Bhaktivinod has sung, My Lord, if you want to kill me, kill me. I'm ready. If you want to save me, then what can, what can possibly harm me? I am yours. You can do anything you like to me. I'm your servant in any situation. That's the quality of fearlessness. That was Prahlad. He realized he was the eternal soul. Snakes can't bite the soul. The soul never dies. And Prahlad was just, if I'm remembering you, my Lord, I'm with you. Nothing else matters. And Bali Maharaj represents Atmanivedanam, surrendering everything to the Lord. Very interesting. Two of the examples of the nine processes of devotional service are the byproducts of the mistake of Kashapa Muni and Diti from the, from the clan of demons, which means 
Jan Maishwarya Shruti Shibir Edamana Madapuman. Queen Kunti said, one should not be proud of one's knowledge or wealth or beauty or one's prestigious family. It's about the free choices we make. If anyone surrenders to the Lord, Sarva Dharman Parityasya, then Krishna gives us shelter, whoever we may be. Gajendra was an elephant. Hanuman was a monkey. Shabri was a nishada. What, is, what was considered an outcast woman. In Vrindavan, there was the Pulinda. One Pulinda woman was selling fruit. She cried out, does anyone want to buy fruit? And Krishna came running to get some fruits. And he saw his parents, his mother. In those days, there was no paper currency. There was the bartering process where you got real things and you gave real things. It was an exchange. It was an exchange of real things. Yes. Paper is not, you know, if you're hungry and you have a hundred crores of rupees, you can't eat your rupees. Real things. So Krishna ran to his to the fruit vendor with some grains in his hand, but he was so enthusiastic, and he's the supreme personality of Godhead. How charming! How sweet! That he could he could he could not keep the grains in his hands. He could keep the sun in orbit. <laughs> <clears throat> For 311 trillion years during Brahma's life, he could keep the sun in orbit, he could keep the earth in orbit, he could keep the oceans, and he's keeping everything in the whole creation, not only in this creation, but in unlimited creation, I mean universes. But that same absolute truth as Nanda Nandana, the son of Nanda. He's such a charming little boy that all the grains are falling as he's running. And by the time he gets to the fruit vendor, there's hardly anything in his hand. And he doesn't know, he just shows. And he's smiling. And this Polinda woman, she's so charmed to see Krishna's beautiful smile, his wonderful form just a little child. She's not thinking this is Param Brahman, the Supreme Lord. She's just thinking he's the, such a beautiful, innocent little boy, and he wants fruits. So he gave her nothing, and she filled his arms with the best of her fruits, all that he could hold, and more. And he was so happy. Can you imagine? And she was piling the fruits in her arms. He was smiling, thinking, so nice. And then Krishna ran home. And, and the fruit vendor lady, she was thinking, so what if I didn't get anything in return? I made him happy. She was just remembering that beautiful form and that smile of his pleasure upon her. And that was a greater wealth than anything she could have possibly had. And then she turned around and she saw that her basket was full of jewels. And according to Jiva Goswami, it's not that she just became ecstasy because now she was rich with jewels. She looked at the jewels, and what put her in ecstasy was the jewel that Krishna placed in her heart, the jewel of love for him. 
She didn't care about the other stuff. She had attained something so, the ultimate perfection of life. So whoever we are, wherever we're coming from, if we just make that choice to give pleasure to Krishna, Krishna gives us the ultimate wealth, the ultimate jewel of prema or love. Kashyapa Muni here, he is showing what is the nature of one who has that love and what is the nature of one who can give that love. Someone who has no false ego. Kashyapa Muni, he is saying here that I am simply going to repeat for you the instruction that I heard from Lord Brahma, my Gurudev. Now, we were saying, Srila Prabhupada understood the nature of the human mind, that this pratishta, this desire for prestige, even in spiritual life, we have this tendency to be very unique. We have this tendency to, to, to take credit. It's about me. Now, here is Srila Prabhupada. What did he do? Seventy years old, he got on that cargo ship, sailed across two oceans, three continents, with nothing, established a movement with thousands and thousands of people and hundreds of temple and millions of books with nothing. It was just based on his incredible determination and empowerment of divine love and compassion. But from the beginning to the very end, he always said the same thing. He said, I am simply repeating what I have heard. What was his realization? What was his sacrifice? What was his devotion? We can give great credit to him, but he never accepted anything for himself. Just repeating what I have heard. He called himself a postal peon. Peon is a very, very menial servant who's just delivering the message. <clears throat> so here Kashyapa Muni is expressing the same spirit for himself. I am simply going to repeat for you. Kashyapa Muni in the previous verses, when he heard Aditi's Harivo, when he heard Aditi's appeal, his first words were, alas, just see the power of Krishna's illusory energy. how it causes the eternal spirit soul, which is totally different from this body and mind, to identify with this body and mind and identify and develop such attachments to the things of this world. And this was his first words. Same first words as Krishna, Kashyapa Muni is, is expressing upon hearing Aditi's complexity. We're not this body. We are part of Krishna. Our real heritage is something very great. You see, the soul is neither born of the Daityas or the Devas. The soul is part of Krishna. Najayate mriyate vaka chit. It has no birth, it has no death. It's transcendent to everything of this world. And he tells Aditi that no one can save us except the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Just worship Krishna. Only through devotion 
Kashapa Muni explains. Just like the Gita. Krishna said, it is only by undivided devotion can I be understood as I am. Similarly, Kashyapa Muni is speaking the same principle. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is merciful to the poor, will fulfill all your desires for devotional service unto him is 